Used to be when people talked about the end of the world, we locked them up or laughed them off. Sometimes both, but we never took them seriously. Maybe we should have. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Better to start at the beginning with the abduction of Desmond Miles, my son. This boy had no ambition, no direction, no plans for the future. What he did have was a heritage, one he chose to deny. It nearly cost him his life. He was captured and imprisoned. Those who took him believed he could help them find something. The apple. One of several artifacts we call pieces of Eden. Bits of ancient technology scattered across the globe. Some hidden, some found, all of them dangerous. Most are held by a single group, the same group that now had Desmond. You know them as Abstergo Industries. We know them as the Templars, as the enemy. We've been fighting them for thousands of years, even longer if you believe the stories of their origins. I do. After all, I've seen the truth. That's the beauty and the horror of the Animus. A device that allows us to enter and experience the lives of our ancestors. It holds the power to change everything, to show us history the way it really happened. Up until its creation, to the victor went the spoils, went the truth. We're trying to fix that, to free minds and bodies both. But there's only so much that we can do, and the Templars have the upper hand these days. But something larger than the Assassins and Templars is approaching, bigger than all of us. And if we can't find a way to stop it, these next few weeks will probably be our last. Everyone's last. In the end, it all comes down to him. To Desmond. Through the Animus, he discovered his heritage, explored the lives of his ancestors, and uncovered their secrets. When that was done, he trained. He used another ancestor to provide decades of experience in the span of a few days. It worked. We think. We hope. Soon, though, soon we'll know. That ominous date fast approaches, December 21st, 2012. None of us knows what it'll bring, only that this is where they want us to be. When it does. They've been guiding us in their own fractured, frustrating way. These voices from the first civilization, the ones who came before, a precursor race of immense power and uncertain motives. They're the ones who made the pieces of Eden. This is where they've led him, and through him, us. He stands at the entrance to this long lost place, armed with the knowledge of Altair and the abilities of Ezio. He holds in his hands the apple of Eden, and we stand at his side, ready to support him however we can. His name is Desmond Miles, and he has brought us to the end. here. Let's go. Well, that was quite the info dump. Were you keeping up? Let's hope I was. So we are here as Desmond. Got our glow stick. Vital. And this is from, well, following straight on from the events of Assassin's Creed 2 and their subsequent uh, expansions, which are Assassin's Creed 2 Brotherhood and Assassin's Creed 2 Revelations. This is what well there are other assassins but this is the modern the modern day assassins and really what remains of Desmond is dad and these two whose names escape me right now but will come back to me in these cutscenes I'm sure So 
Someone's graffitied this wall, how dare they? In another moment, down went Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was to get out again. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate that. Appreciate the Alice in Wonderland reference. Okay, so now we know his name is Sean. Uh, how are they marching ahead? That was weird. Maybe the lighting just took a moment to catch up there. These games do manage to get a few bugs in there. How are you going to climb up here? These boxes, lads. Lads and lasses, I should say. Is her name Zoe? I'll remember. Well, this apple is handy. I think we're here. You think, Desmond? You think? Whoa! Lost my glow stick! My glow stick. Oh, it's here. It's here. Pick up the glow stick. Oh, I don't think I can. Oh, well. Bye bye, glow stick. Don't, don't worry, guys. Just, I'll figure it out for you, I guess. Or you could just slide down with your boxes. Use your boxes as sleds. How about that? Uh, I'll just carry on. Look at this walk. Good bowl on him. Good bowl on him, Desmond. Well, it does look. It does look cleaned up from the original. Oh, come on. Supposed to be a master assassin, Desmond. You don't need to... You can just hop that. It's not even parkour. How, how did he get down here? Bloody hell. Convenient. It's right next to the keyhole. Rebecca, that's her name. Uh, yeah. What happened? The temple triggered a bleeding effect. You collapsed and entered into a fugue state. So naturally, you dropped me into the Animus instead of, I don't know, making sure I was okay? You weren't in any danger. Besides, the temple appeared to be communicating with you. And I didn't want to risk severing the connection. At least not until we knew what it wanted. Right. Of course. Son, I... No, it's fine. I get it. And I know what I'm looking for, by the way. It's a key. 
She's no idea where it is, though. I guess that's why she triggered the bleeding effect. She? Juno, dead. She's talking to me. Okay, Desmond. Okay. While you were, uh, visiting Constantinople, we picked up a software update for the Animus. I'd like to run a couple of quick tests, make sure there aren't any major issues. All right. What do you need me to do? We'll start simple. Walk to the marker over there. I can do that. So Constantinople was the location for Assassin's Creed Revelations, the previous game in the sequence. Okay, Desmond, let's practice climbing on these objects. It's easy enough. Quick shimmy shimmy. Where are we at? Do we need to jump back? Just go shimmy shimmy this way. And round. Free run your way through this little obstacle course. Hard to see this obstacle course, just all white on white. Cream on cream. Slide. Run up That's here. That's a constraint. These are optional objectives that raise your synchronization rate. All right, Desmond. Follow the on-screen instructions and kill the two Templars. Easy. Nope. Oh. Well, I'll just All stab him this way. Here is jump the gap. Next. I guess we go this way. Oh, this is the gap. Okay, we made it. This isn't the gap. Guess there's more. more. Okay. Up, up, up. Are we going to get more instructions? Where are we going? Synchronization levels look good now. We should be able oh. to build the world. Time to find out what the temple wants from you. Nice tricorn. If you could build the world a little faster, that'd be appreciated. It's. It's uh, not finished, shall we say. What sir. if I run? Sir. Everything all right, sir? Yes, fine. I'm just preoccupied, that's all. Don't forget Hate your them. invitation. Master Birch will be meeting you inside. Thank you. Where shall I retrieve you once you're done? Front of the Opera House. And be quick about it. Don't expect to be here long. I'll bring her round at once. Hmm. Who is Haytham? I've forgotten a lot about these games. So, we'll relearn it together. Alright, well, I guess we start the mission. Invitation, please. <laughs> Shall I take your coat, sir? Nope. Covent Garden. Very nice. You email it. Now it's not Ladies the time to send me an email. Gentlemen, you are requested to kindly find your seats. Let's read the Animus entry for the Theatre Royal. You might hear this referred to as Covent Garden, which it faces. 
or the Royal Opera House, which it later became. However, this is the original Theatre Royal building, opened in 1732, destroyed by fire in 1808. It will be rebuilt, then destroyed by fire again in 1857, and then almost completely renovated in the 1990s. They've installed a smoke detector this time. Ha <laughs> ha. The original theatre lineup was varied, containing ballet, operas, even acrobatics. Many of Handel's operas opened here right up until his death in 1759, when he mysteriously stopped writing them. <laughs> but the building was mainly used for presenting plays, at least for the first hundred years of its history. The reason? It held the exclusive rights to perform spoken drama in London, awarded by King Charles II. Yes, kings could do that, though why they would is beyond me. So these entries are written by Sean Hastings, uh, one of the assassins. Um, I can't remember who voices him. It's um, a British comedian slash writer of some kind uh, whose name escapes me. But um, so he he's the comic relief ki kind of character, as well as being the like one of the whiz kids for the assassins. So I think I'll I'll read the entries as we go, um, just as they pop up. Have I got any others to? I probably got the gang. Yeah, so Sean Hastings. <laughs> Sean Hastings is one of the few members of the Assassins who wasn't raised to join the Order. He was recruited as a teenager after his investigations into Abstergo Industries made him a target for the Templars. Hastings has a gift for organisation, and as such, the Assassins would be lost without him. With his talent for making connections between historical events, He's widely regarded as the most intelligent person in the Order. And by widely regarded as the most intelligent person in the Order, I mean he is the most intelligent person in the Order. You may think he's an arrogant bastard, but that's only because he's smarter than you, and like a less than able teenage girl, you find yourself not yet secure enough to move past your inherent and powerful feelings of joyless jealousy, and simply appreciate me for who I am. Oh good, you're actually reading these. I was beginning to wonder if I was wasting my time, because you know how much I love wasting my time. Now, make me make me some tea, would you? So, you know, he writes them. Altair ibn Lahad. No, Altair ibn Lahad. Sorry. Born 1165 AD, Altair was born into the Assassin Brotherhood in the stronghold of. Is it Ma of Masyaf? His early life wasn't a happy one. His mother died during childbirth. Then, when he was a young boy, his father was killed during the first siege of Masyaf. Only shortly thereafter, the assassin he died to save committed suicide in front of the 11 year old Altair. Oops, skipped too far there. With his parents gone, Altair looked to Al Mualim. Al Mualim, the then mentor of the Order, as a father figure. Al Mualim recognized Altair's potential and took on his training personally. Altair reached rank of Master Assassin by the age of 25, an unheard of accomplishment. If there was an Assassin book of records, there'd probably be a picture of this fella on the front. Haha! <laughs> Altair was one of the best fighters in Assassin history, with an arrogance to match. After a disastrous mission in 1191 in which he broke the creed and very nearly let an apple of Eden fall into Templar hands, Altair was sent back down to novice rank and forced to begin again. As part of his rehabilitation, he was responsible for taking out the major players in the Templar Order at the time, including the Grand Master Robert de Sable. Is it Robert de Sable? Or Robert de Sable? Well, he did. Robert de Sable. There you go. Tragically, in the end, he was also forced to kill Al Mualim, who turned out to be both a Templar and corrupted by the influence of the apple. Oof, tough. After his mentor's death, Altair took control of the order, turning it into the secret and world-spanning organization it is today. One of the things that made Altair such a deadly assassin was something we now call Eagle Vision, a kind of sixth sense inherited from the first civilization. It allowed him to read his enemies and surroundings in a way that goes beyond what the human eye can see. Of course, you'll know more about that than me. I can't believe I just typed that because it's in your blood, and that's part of why you're here. Well, let's be honest. You knew you weren't here because of my enduring affection, or my warm and passionate cuddles. 
Oh, Sean. Alright, last entry so far. Ezio Auditore, who you play as in Assassin's Creed 2. Altair was the protagonist of Assassin's Creed 1. So Ezio got three games. He got Assassin's Creed 2, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, and Assassin's Creed Revelations. Born 1459. Ezio Auditore di Firenze was a master assassin during the Italian Renaissance, as well as being an inheritor to the mysterious ability of Eagle Vision and one of your ancestors. Ezio was something of a playboy in his teenage years, but his life changed in 1476 when his father and brothers were arrested and executed for treason. Ezio tried to save them, but the evidence clearing their names mysteriously disappeared in the hands of a family friend. Instead, they were hanged as Ezio looked on. Ezio fled with his mother and sister to Monteregione, where he, fought, where he sought refuge with his uncle, Mario Auditore. While Ezio had originally intended to continue on and settle in Spain, Mario had other ideas. He was the leader of the Italian Assassin Brotherhood, and spent the next several years training Ezio and convincing him to help fight the Templars responsible for the deaths of his father and brothers. Ezio spent the next decade assassinating his way through the Templar ranks, eventually cornering the Templar Grand Master, Rodrigo Borgia, in Venice in 1487. Borgia got away, but Ezio was able to recover an Apple of Eden and was formally inducted into the Assassin Order. After several setbacks over the next few years, Ezio travelled to Rome in 1499, this is Brotherhood, to confront Rodrigo, who by then had become Pope Alexander VI. After defeating Rodrigo but sparing his life, Ezio opened a hidden vault under the Sistine Chapel. There he discovered a message left by the first civilization, warning of a catastrophe that would threaten to wipe out humanity. Yes, that would be the one we're facing right now. Now when I played through that it blew my mind, because all of a sudden aliens are introduced out of nowhere, um, and the alien is, the projection is talking to Ezio. But telling Ezio that it's not him that's important, it's Desmond. So Ezio in 1499 hears the name Desmond and is like, Desmond? And you realise that they're talking through time to you? It, it's, it was wild. It was wild. I remember just playing through that and being, what? Over the next 20 or so years, Ezio worked at strengthening the Italian Assassin Brotherhood and fighting the Templars, which is sort of what we do. One of his greatest accomplishments would be discovering a hidden library belonging to Altair, hidden under the former assassin stronghold at Masyaf, and containing the message, another message from the first civilization. He retired from the Brotherhood shortly thereafter, which is what we call ending on a high note. He was terrific at jumping too. He died in Florence in 1524. Yeah, just lived his life. Good lad, Ezio. Top lad. Any other locations? No. Okay. Okay. Shall we attend the opera? Excuse me. Thank you. Good evening, sir. This way, please. Okay. Excuse me. My apologies. It's all right. There we go. Evening, Haytham. Reginald? I can't tell you how happy I was to hear they'd mounted this revival. Gay's best work by far. Have you seen it before? Once. My father brought me here as a child. Though I remember little of it. I don't suppose tonight will afford me the luxury of a proper viewing either. No, I'm afraid it won't. On to business then. Do you see him? Ooh. This is a great setting though. I mean, I love this. I love the historical element to Assassin's Creed games. It's why I keep coming back. Like me too, he acted at double capacity, both against Rhodes and Paul. He seated in one of the boxes above. The stairs are watched. You'll need to find another way up. Like Maul at Saint Wu, 
word of trial comes on in the afternoon. I already have. And she hopes you will order matters oh, so as to bring her off. As the wench is very active and industrious, you may satisfy her that I'll soften the evidence. Tom Gag, sir, is found guilty. A lazy dog. When I took him to A thousand pardons. I told him what uh, I a thousand apologies. pardons. Sit back down, sir. Without reprieve. Reginald Birch. I right, we should quickly read his entry. Reginald Birch was a London merchant, the son of another London merchant, who, conveniently enough, also had the last name Birch. It seems it was one of those hard-to-put-your-finger-on things that ran in the family. So funny, Sean, isn't he? Ha ha ha! Birch started in business for himself at an early age. By the time he was in his mid-twenties, he already owned several merchant ships, mainly dealing with the tea trade to the American colonies. That's pretty good going, seeing as by the time most people are in their mid-twenties, they don't even own a shirt. I have him as part owner of the Providence, among others. Later in life, Birch also owned several businesses in and around London. He was a member of White's, which was a posh gentleman's club in London, and generally a well-known and respected man, or man about town. From what I can tell, Birch met Haytham Kenway while working for his father, Edward. They were introduced at White's while Haytham was still quite young. Birch would eventually take over Haytham's education, tutoring him while on a tour of Europe in the 1730s. From what we've seen in the Animus, it seems their friendship continued into adulthood, with them working together as members of the Assassins. Oh yes. Okay. So Haytham is an assassin? Wait, do I have to go this way? Surely they'll see me. Hello. These people aren't seeing me? Don't interrupt this furious necking. Oh, uh. Okay. Are they not going to see me across the way? Can I not go? Well, let me go down further, so why can't I go right? There we go. Tom Gag, sir, is found guilty. Oh, lazy dog. When I took him the time before, I told him what would come to if he did not mend his hand. This is death. I'm just. How is no one seeing me? How are they not seeing me? It's just a bloke climbing up there on the balconies. They'd see me. I'm calling bullshit. Okay, hold the tension, wait till my controller rumbles. There we go. Job's done. Guess we have to jump. Ooh. Oh! Did they not hear that? I've got a bit of stage fright. A little Dutch girl jump with a blooming cheek. The Beggar's Opera. Is that what we're watching? The Beggar's Opera opened in London in 1728. It's a musical, one of the earliest ever created. It was written by John Gay, a writer and friend of both Alexander Pope and Jonathan Swift, two of the prominent literary figures of the day. The opera was both popular and controversial. Popular, partly because it was an excellent skewering of Italian opera, 
which was very popular at the time. However, instead of complicated Italian songs, <laughs> complicated Italian songs, the Beggar's Opera featured folk tunes that the audience could recognise, meaning you could hum along even if you didn't know Italian. It was controversial because of the subject matter. It's set in the Newgate prison, and the main characters are all criminals who act much like the upper classes. It was a send-up of the British nobility, including veiled criticism of the head of government, neither of whom traditionally have a sense of humour. I've never met a queen who liked a not-not joke. Ha <laughs> ha. Actually, I've never met a queen. Ha. <laughs> the Beggar's Opera was accused of being a base form of entertainment, and, because its main characters were criminals, accused of causing increasing crime. It's nice to see that criticism isn't just for movies and video games. Bloody opera. Corrupting our kids. Good old Sean. Jeremy's really burning up the boards tonight. He's a mob. Appreciation for our actors. That's what we like. It is a pleasure to be the messenger of comfort to friends and affliction. But it is now high time to look about me for a decent execution. Hey, them. You should have come to me. We would have found another way. Yes. But then you would have known. For what it's worth, I'm sorry. As am I. Uh oh. It's a bit cavalier. We should probably leave. Because there's going to be a scream behind us in a couple of seconds, I have to imagine. Let's get a bit of a. Yep. Oh! Oh my! I, I've done no wrong. I swear. Sir, any weapons? I beg your pardon. Did they fire? Best get out, out of here. Please, please, please. Do, 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 do. Excuse me, fellas. We must have order. Try to remember. Oh, it's all kicking off now, isn't it? Yep, yep. Plays on hold. Oh, and the actors were doing so well. What are those men doing? Yeah, I mean, this crowd's oblivious. They didn't see me jumping across the place. So I'll just be on my way. Where are you going? Don't mind me, everyone. Awfully sorry for that. Almost there. Ooh, there's too many people. Oh, the world's still broken outside. That's disconcerting. Alright. Excuse me. And how was the opera? Rather dull, truth be told. Shall we be off then? Aye. To Fleet and Bride. By your command. Shall we be off then? Fascinating. Gentlemen, I hold in my hand a key. And if this book is to be believed, it will open the doors of a storehouse built by those who came before. Ah, yes. Those who ruled, reigned, and vanished from the world. Do we know what it is that will be held within? 
It could contain certain knowledge, perhaps a weapon or something as yet unknown, unfathomable in its construction and purpose. It could be any of these things, or none of them. They are still an enigma, these precursors. But of one thing I am certain. Whatever waits behind those doors shall prove a great boon to us all. Or our enemies, should they find it first. They won't. You've seen to that. I assume you know where this storehouse is? Ah, Mr. Harrison. Gentlemen. How fair your calculations? I believe the site lies somewhere within this region. That's a lot of ground to cover. My apologies. Were that I could be more accurate. That's all right. It suffices for a start. And that is why we've called you here, Master Kenway. We'd like for you to travel to America, locate the storehouse, and take possession of its contents. I'm yours to command, although a job of this magnitude will require more than just myself. Of course. Upon this paper are the names of five men sympathetic to our cause. Each is also uniquely suited to aid you in your endeavor. With them at your side, you will want for nothing. Well, then I'd best be on my way. I knew our faith in you was not misplaced. We've booked you passage to Boston. Your ship leaves at dawn. Go forth, Haytham, and bring honor to us all. All right, sequence one, done. Haytham Kenway on his way to Boston. To the new world. To the new world. Want that hat? 